Welcome and good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Pastor Curtis. If you don't already know, it's a privilege and an honor to spend a little time with you this morning and share a little bit of what God's put on my heart. But first and foremost, I want to welcome you each here at Bear. Thank you for making this place of service here your worship service. Also, I want to reach out to Middletown and say thank you guys for making your way there and being part of the community of belief in faith in Jesus Christ. Also, for those who are online, what a, pr- what a pleasure it is to interact as the body of believers in multiple places in Jesus' name, all believing God's doing something in our midst at Love, at Love of Christ Church. Amen? Amen? You with me? Amen. Dan's the only one not. Okay. I have to heckle him because he's, he's the one that heckles me. So... And, and all that, just thank you for being here today, and I just want to say um, it's a privilege. And today, I'm going to build on what was started last week. Pastor Farr started the series called, What Would Jesus Undo? And he talked about indifference, indifference last week, and I'm going to talk about hypocrisy this week. And the whole place just got quiet, especially right here. So we own this moment. When we hear about it, we talk about it, and God speaks to us about it. But literally, I want to talk about that moment. Back in the 90s, when somebody took the phrase of what would Jesus do, and they put it on a bracelet, and it became a defining principle of if you have questions about your faith and you're wondering how it works and what you want to do, let's model our efforts after what would Jesus do. If you were in that moment of temptation, what would Jesus' actions be? That's a pretty high bar to set, but it's one that we can aspire to because he's forgiven us and brought us together in faith through him to the Father. That he is our great high priest that has brought us there. So if you will, we can aspire to it. We can be part of what would Jesus do because he's in our lives. He's in our hearts and he's changing us. So building on that principle is that knowing he has such good things for us to do, what things might he say he should undo to help us further what we should do? So today I want to talk a little bit about that specifically hypocrisy. And if you're wondering what that is, most of us know, let's just, let's clarify to make certain that Dan gets this today. It says claiming or teaching and believing something, but not practicing it. That's a, that's a challenge. And usually we're really good at spotting it in someone else's life, right? But we're, we're somewhat blind to how it works in our own life. I would never, and I could never, and oh, wait a minute, I did? Yeah, that's how it works. So if you're wondering, have you done it? And what places you've done it? There's a safe place you can ask. Ask your family. And you're like, they'll get at least one or two things for you going. And you may get a list that's even as many as 10, depending on where you stand in this issue. But today it's not about judgment. It's more about a cautionary road sign of what hypocrisy can do if left unchecked. So we're going to talk about it today in that healthy way. That Jesus, if you will, didn't say that we were guilty as so much as a lifestyle. He cautioned us about what it could do. So that's what I'm going to try to build on what he shared, what he said. Now, I think hypocrisy, it branches out from the fact that we understand how faith works and how it should work. But we stop a little short when that faith isn't working in our lives and try to produce it through our works. So we think the faith is good, wonderful thing, but however, I fall back to a carnal mindset that says, I'll do it in my own power. I'll do it by works alone. That's where I think we fall into hypocrisy. And it becomes a part of our lives, meaning it happens enough that we get a little familiar with it and it gets dangerous. So how dangerous is it really? What, what outcome really results from this issue if left unchecked? Sometimes it's because we see it as part of our lives and it's been introduced to us and we're thinking, well, maybe it's not so bad and we're kind of just being casual about it. Let's not think it won't change who we are. It has a real power if we give it power. So since we've all experienced this, since we, we're very familiar with what it is in our lives, since we aren't uncertain of the danger of it, I want to talk specifically about why Jesus would undo hypocrisy. And the one statement he makes, it's, it's, uh, it's something he says in Matthew 16, 6 to his disciples. It's not in your notes, but this is an extra. This, he says to them, he says, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees in their teaching because that's going to cause you problems. And they were like, what, we're out of bread? They were kind of like, what? We don't understand. Jesus said, are you so dull? Listen, 
Their teachings, that little bit of influence of the works and the hypocrisy, is like yeast that works itself through the dough. A little bit goes a long way. Be careful of that yeast. It can cause you great harm. So it's cautionary. These are his disciples, his closest disciples to him. Be careful, he says. So how is he trying to teach them to do better? He's saying, live a life of integrity. Do the right thing in a reliable way. When you say you're going to do it, actually do it. But more, more than that, have, be honest and have strong moral values that you support and practice each day. And when you have trouble with it, don't stop short of trying to improve it. Live a life of integrity. So be careful. Don't let that yeast make its way into your lives. So this is how we see Jesus speaking in cautionary detail. Like, be careful. So there's three areas that I'd like to address this morning, specifically I see in Scripture, that we can draw a lot from. And these three areas are those, those cautionary, and, and it, be, be careful because they are harmful moments that Jesus shares. And the first being point A, hypocrisy, it distorts a clear perspective. Now think for a moment, you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, how does that work? Well, in your health, we all agree, we should all eat healthy, right? There's just a good process, lots of you know, green vegetables, and we should eat balanced and keep our calorie count. But when we show up to the restaurant and we go, wow, man, that's a great menu, especially the Cheesecake Factory. That place has, it has a menu for days. And I don't think hardly any of them have low calories. So we're all looking at them and we go, man, that steak, that potato, whoo, it's only 2,300 calories. We threw the health issues right out the window because we're going to eat that. Well, I won't eat like that every day. So we, we, we break down right there. What about our finances? We say, man, it would be amazing to be debt-free and stay that way until the car of your dream drives past and you're like, man, that guy looks a lot like me. I, could, I would look good in that car. And then we go out and finance it to the degree that it's like 25% or something crazy like that. And then we're like, wait a minute, what just happened? Temptation rolled in and our best efforts to live the right thing just went out the window because our practices broke at that moment. Is it all bad? No, but it's dangerous. What if in relationships, you talk about loving people and caring for people, and then when the moment of difficulty comes in a relationship, you're the first one to jump out out to judge you're you're the one to disappear when you need you know to be supported there it's you had a well-meaning understanding of what relationships look like but you didn't do the right thing at the right time we've all done those kinds of things so this is cautionary to what that looks like so when we go to our scripture here i want you to bring some of that with you applications you could think of in your mind where maybe you're the one that is guilty of this just maybe so here scripture says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Granted, he's not saying don't do it, but don't do it like this. Hey brother, I noticed that uh, yeah, your finances don't look so good today. Oh, I know I'm dead. No, don't worry about that. So it's all good. Uh, you know, I just want to talk to you about today, and as you're bashing him in the head with your plank, let me get that speck out of your eye. You, you see, I'm going to be a little exaggerating here, but sometimes we, we, we show up in that perspective. We show up with having a full fault, and it's like, man, I, I, I can't even look around that thing. It's pretty bad. And we're trying to help people. The motivation to help is good, but we got to go to here first. We got to get our perspective cleaned up as far as we've taken our issues to God first. We've submitted ourselves. We're not perfect, but we're saying, God, I want you to use me. If you happen to use me to help my brother or sister get corrected, make my heart right first. Start with me. It all starts here. Now, here's, here's a little analogy, if you will, that might help you, just might, just might help you. So ladies, this is for you. Have you ever gotten dressed in the morning and you got the right outfit on and now it's just a matter of the shoes? We gotta work those shoes out, right? Because it's a very important detail. So you've, this is a possibility, just maybe a possibility. In your closet, you have shoes that are similar but different in color. So you got that blue flat and you got that brown flat and you're doing this in the mirror. Hmm, which looks better? Hmm. And you do that and then you get distracted for just a moment, just one little moment and then you forget and you walk out of the house, two different shoes on. 
but you're feeling good. Man, I'm dressed to the nines today. Ain't nobody can see. Man, this is just, I just feel good. And then on the way to the office, you're like, man, she doesn't look as good as I do. This outfit is kicking. And then you get to the, the, the office and you, you drop your pen and you look down and you go, oh my Lord. Behind the desk and you're like, trying to cover that shoe up and they're trying not to make it obvious and you, you go to the bathroom real quick and you just dodge and, and you're like, you're feeling very self-conscious about the mismatched shoes. Your greatest intention was to go really well dressed, but you got two different color shoes on now. Yeah, and all the time you're like, I thought I was better than them. Guys, you're not off the hook, neither am I. Have you run real quick in the morning, got dressed, showered, and done all your thing, and you feel, man, I'm good, I got everything, I'm on time, I'm great, and then you get to the office and you go, hmm, that's strange. Someone up here is funky. Mm. Don't they know about personal hygiene? Good Lord. Mm. And then you just keep, keep going around, and you're like, man, is it that guy? Man, he doesn't, he's not dressed so well. Mm. It, it, it's got to be him. And then you reach up and grab something off the shelf, and the funk just hits you in the face. Look, woo, Lord, hold on now. I didn't expect it to be me. I forgot my deodorant. So all the while, what were we doing? We were blaming everyone else for bringing the funk in the joint. But it was us, and we were blind to it. How did that happen? We're people of a short perspective. We're people that are flawed, that need help to see with a clear perspective of why Jesus would undo hypocrisy. He, we, we need to know and understand that, if you will, if we deal with our issues first through prayer, reflection, and most importantly, honest feedback, those you trust that are in your life that you can go to and say, hey, I've been having this issue. Do you see anything I can to improve on it? And they go, hmm, where do we start? <laughs> now, I'm just talking about you've got to have honest people in your life. You've got to have people who love you. When you ask them this question, that they're really not coming after you. I'm sure they're going to have fun with you. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you need, but if, you, if you'll do this, you can prevent this distorted perspective. You can prevent this plank in your eye because you're going to God first, and then you're going to those you trust. And then, if you will, God calls you to tell somebody about some correction you need to make. You're in the right place. That's where we want to be. None of us want to go and challenge people being wrong mismatched shoes and funky underarms. We want, we want to do the right thing. We really want God to use us. So that's our first point. Second point, point B, is that hypocrisy, it defiles a clean heart. So that what I'm talking about is the unrepentant sin that corrupts our hearts in the form of hypocrisy will create an issue, a long-standing issue, a deep issue if you don't deal with it. Now, before I share this particular scripture with you, let me share you about the six preceding, preceding verses. That the Pharisees came to Jesus, and they're saying, hey, Jesus, did you know? And he's, he's like, I'm listening. Um, your disciples have, they're eating without washing their hands first. He goes, oh. He says, why is that? So Jesus is really good about answering a question with a question. He goes, I'll, well, hold on. You tell me why you chose not to honor your parents in choice or in preference to your religious practices and traditions. Hmm. So you're trying to tell me how dirty their hands are when that's a small thing. When you have decided to forego, you're, you're honoring your parents as under the law. They had to honor your father and your mother so that your days might be long, that things might go well with you. You said just consider anything I might have given as a gift to God so that I might go on and do my own religious traditional beliefs. Yeah, he said that's pretty bad. And here's where he picks up. He says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into a, someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So all this hypocrisy, all this judgment that they, they, they've been building up in their hearts, comes out in that moment. They need to wash their hands. He said, you need to wash your heart. Amen. You need to deal with the issues that are on your plate before you start talking to me about the disciples. Because they're well-meaning people, and they're on their way because they're listening and learning, and they're teachable. You are not. You hypocrite. Don't you come to me and talk to me about this. So you get it worked out with you. 
Now, something that uh, in Bible college years ago, a professor shared with me, it's such a small thing, but it's, it's a big thing in the sense that Pharisee has become synonymous with hypocrite. And the reason is because they typified it. They, uh, they, they had a profound abuse of what it was to be a hypocrite. And he said, if you would, think of it this way. There's so much about the show. There's so much about how they look and how they, how they do things and how they pray and how eloquent they are. And, and he said, think of it this way. A Pharisee is fair I see with a corrupt heart. They, they, you see something that looks good, but they're corrupt. So if, if, you'll never forget that, will you? Fair I see with a corrupt heart. However, where I'm going after is that this, this lives potentially in all of us. If left unchecked, we will have a defiled heart. If left unchecked, we will be the judgmental group of people who no one wants to be around, who Jesus is now yelling at. Now, keep in mind, we only discipline those whom we love. So when Jesus was giving them the right act, the, the Pharisees, he was trying, if you will, to provoke them to repentance. It was so hardened that their ears were so dull, they couldn't hear anything but chastisement. And to be shamed in public, because that was where their importance was. If, if they're about flowing robes and looking good and sounding good, and then Jesus is, he's that crazy, wild, New Testament guy that's, that's coming out. He's, he calls himself the Messiah, and he's calling us out in public and shaming us. What he was trying to do was to redeem them, trying to shake them from what you know is wrong. Why don't you check it? Why don't you look at it? Why don't you look at your heart? So he wasn't being mean for just mean's sake. He was being mean and confronting them because he thought they could be redeemed. He thought there was still a heart that could be cleaned and brought back, and that's why he did it. And Jesus, even in Matthew 23, 37, which is not in your notes, talks about where he's looking down on Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've tried to gather you as a hen does her chicks under her wing, but you would have none of it. You were the ones that stoned the prophets and killed them. And yet I still want you redeemed. And yet I still will try. And, and he wept at the thought that those souls would perish because of that belief, because of that practice hypocrisy, make no doubt about it, defiles a clean heart. I think we all start at even territory. God gives us the opportunity to call out to him, gives us the opportunity to reach him. None of us are unredeemable unless we walk completely away from God on purpose. He's chasing us down. He's looking for us. He's looking to gather us as his church, his people, called by his name, his children. And thirdly, as we think about why would Jesus undo hypocrisy, I'm thinking point C, because it derails the heavenly destination. That's strong. That's, that's big. If, if your eternal destination is being shifted because of this attitude of hypocrisy, it makes me want to look at it even that much more. Let's read our scripture. It says, Then Jesus said, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you because they are really well trained in the law. However, but they do not, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. That's a pretty tall accusation. That you yourself have interacted in hypocrisy so much that your eternal destination is on the line. If you don't get this right, you will break the gates of hell wide open, that you will find yourself in a fiery destination. And that what he's saying to the Pharisees in this, he's also saying that your practices of teaching and helping other people find God are literally causing them to, to lose their, their destination in heaven. Because your teachings are based on hypocrisy. Your teachings are based on your traditional practices of religion. And you're, you're closing the door in people's faces because you're telling them, those who might find it, you're telling them they're wrong. Have you ever seen that take place? In conversations, in other places, I have. It's dangerous. And I'm not, I'm not throwing accusations out here because I realize what's at stake I don't want to judge others, but I want to warn others. 
I want to tell people that be careful because this could pull you away from a relationship with Christ that takes you to heaven. The law of religion, without any grace to temper it, can only judge. That's all it does. It only finds fault. Where the law taught us, Jesus perfected and filled it and and made it right with God and then gave us the grace in which to work under. So the law, if you will, practice of that, without any grace, doesn't have the ability to save. That's where they were. Both teacher and student are lost because of a legalistic form, a belief that they think their works can carry them to heaven. Boy, is that dangerous territory. The greater need, the bigger thing to do is to practice God's grace. And the best way to do it is this. If you find yourself trending towards that moment where you feel like, man, I'm just, I do so much better than others. You go, hold on a minute. We're all messed up. And if you see somebody having trouble, you go, you know what? In grace, I see myself doing those same kinds of things. And I would need someone to apply grace to my life, so I'll apply it to theirs first. That just because they haven't gotten it right doesn't mean they're not going to get it right. Just because they're on their way doesn't mean they're not going to make it. They're making the journey too. And we could do this together. Our journey could be, instead of judgment, could be grace-filled moments of observation. That you could talk to somebody, so long as you've got yourself, your heart right, filled with grace, you could go talk to somebody about what you've observed and let them be the indicator of what they're going to do. Not telling them they're, they're going to have to do this because they're terrible people. Hey, brother, I noticed that you do this, or sister, that you've done that, and I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to encourage you. I've, I've discovered in my own life I've made the same mistake, and here was a remedy that helped me. Wouldn't that be a little bit better? That I'm not judging, I'm, I'm with you. Tell me how I can pray for you. Tell me, I mean, maybe these sound too formal, Put it in your own words, how you would say it, what you would do, that you would express grace and love for people, that you want want them to find heaven. You don't want hypocrisy to take them out. And Jesus was the best fulfillment of the law, and he gives us that grace to work under. So, So we don't leave off on a, man, that's a heavy, difficult word to take. What can we say? What remedy would Jesus give us to work under this. Yes, grace is part of it. But what remedy would he give us? He would tell us to model a life of integrity based on what we see in his scripture. Based on all the labors of his ministry here on earth. His death, burial, and resurrection contained in the scriptures. Why wouldn't we go to it? Why wouldn't we look at it as a guide for our lives? Why wouldn't we take up lessons in there that are good for application? If you will, I look at it. And I see God's word as as something that we can draw that integrity from. Let's read our scripture. It says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may put, so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. That's the kind of integrity. We're doing things so cleanly, so transparently that there is no error in our ways because we're not following our ways. We're following God's ways. He's got our hearts right, set on the right path. Then an an opponent might say something, but they're without cause. Now, I look at God's word, again, as a standard, but also a mirror. If I'm not doing something right, and I look at the practices in the Bible, from the perspective of not a carnal mind, but a spiritual mind. Holy Spirit, please reveal to me what you, were, what you were writing down in the scriptures here. And then I look at it and I go, oh, that's not my practice. So I need to amend what I'm doing to line up with God's word to the degree that when, it, when I look in that mirror spiritually of his word, I go, oh, now I understand. Now I know what it feels like to practice that. Now I've really worked hard. We're all on a journey together in faith. And that's what we're doing. So one of the things that I could see that maybe, maybe helps us connect the dots on this is this. It may sound odd, but Michael Jackson, back in 1987, wrote a song called Man in the Mirror. I'm sorry, I didn't write a song. He performed a song. And in that song, he's talking about the disparity between the poverty he sees around him and the wealth that he has. And he wants to do something to help there. And he says in Man in the Mirror, he says, these, these are the lyrics. He says, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him 
to change his ways. And no message could, been, could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. Simple but profound words, isn't it? That he's standing in a mirror going, I see the disparity of this poverty. What can I do? Where is my responsibility in this moment? You know what the coolest part is? Jesus doesn't keep record of wrongs. He doesn't list them out. He doesn't remember how you've fallen short. Put it under the blood, and he purposely, purposely forgets it, covers. He doesn't just cover it. He removes the sin. So we're talking about the redemption so deep that Jesus covers our shortcomings, covers them completely, fills in the gaps where we can't by faith. So today, when we think about how do we model that life of integrity, we look to God's word, the mirror spiritually that we need to look at our actions, to look at our lives and apply something in grace, knowing Jesus is for us, not against us. Wants our best possible future today being walked out. If you know that he believes you in that deeply, how could you not follow that path? Well, the only way you wouldn't is if you decide not to. So today I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and pray with me as we ask God and Jesus himself to give us the power to do this today. Lord Jesus, we, I ask that you walk through each one of our lives today. Examine our hearts and find those places of, of, of hypocrisy where we're not making it right. I ask that you, Lord, shine a light on it, help us deal with it, repent of it, and move in our best possible future that you've purposed for us. So Lord Jesus, I ask that you apply that now. Take your people that are called by your name, that are your children, myself included, and take us the next step down the road in our faith. And we'll thank you for it. We give you glory and honor for it now in Jesus' name. Also, I want to talk about how, as we're praying, there is a moment where somebody becomes aware that they're not saved, that they need the grace of Jesus Christ, that they need this moment of salvation. And up to this point, they didn't feel it. And if you're in the house and you felt the moment that you haven't called Jesus your Lord and Savior, and now you're prepared to, if you're with us in Middletown or if you're with us online and you're feeling this moment, I want to take a few moments and pray with you. And if you would, everyone here, pray along with me for the salvation of the souls of those people who feel the Holy Spirit speaking to them today. Let's, let's call out, Lord Jesus, I'm a broken person and I need healing. First of all, I ask that you forgive me for all of my sins. Make them as far as the east is from the west. Remove them from my life and make me your child today. I want to thank you for this opportunity to know you, Jesus. Thank you for making me your child. Fill me with your power. Give me my calling so that I might follow it with you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a round of applause for decisions made. We ask you if you made any kind of decision of faith today to take the Connect card, fill it out, drop it in the offering bucket as it's passed. This is the moment of where we come together in faith, be it rededication, first time confession of faith, prayer request, what have you. We, we take the moment and take it very seriously to walk the next step of faith with you in it. So if you would, take the moment now, fill that out and let us know and we'll get you some information. Amen? Church, one more time, let's give a round of applause for what God's doing in our hearts.